Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Kyle Bauer talks to Michelle Lorenzo with Elanco Animal Health about how good employee welfare directly correlates to better animal welfare. She explains what conditions directly affect workers. Next up, Greg Akagi brings us the Kansas soybean update. Then Dwayne Taves talks with Dr. Kelly Sanders of Westway Feed Products. He discusses a new concept in the beef industry, fetal programming or epigenetics, and what impact it has on the industry. Then we'll find out what's going on around the state with the Kansas Farm Bureau update. And to wrap up, it's Plain Talk with Kyle and Dwayne. It's all coming up on Farm Factor. Stay tuned. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. Earlier in my life, I rode bucking horses and rodeos, and my shoulders took such a beating, and that was probably the reason for having several previous surgeries on both shoulders. About a year ago, I decided that I didn't want to have another surgery. And so I contacted Kansas Regenerative Medicine, took their treatment process. It was relatively pain-free. Now, after eight months, my shoulders have healed to the point where I think I'm probably 90 to 95 percent of normal. It takes a couple of months to start to see results and feel real progress. That continued to increase gradually until now at approximately eight months. And I'm extremely pleased. I've got full range of motion. I can lift weights, I can throw, I can do uh, a lot of things that uh, I couldn't do without a lot of pain previously. So I'm, I'm tickled to death with the results and I'd recommend this process to anyone. This segment brought to you by Kansas Wheat. Learn more at rediscoverwheat.org. Welcome back to Farm Factor. Up first today, Kyle Bauer is with Michelle Lorenzo. She discusses how worker welfare is important to animal welfare. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have the opportunity to visit with Michelle Lorenzo. She works with Alanco as Chief Animal Welfare Officer. But, you know, as I listened to your presentation, Michelle, it sounded like to me it was almost an employee welfare issue. Am I making a leap? I shouldn't. Uh, no, I actually am finding more and more that uh, our industry's done a wonderful job focusing on our animals, keeping them comfortable, keeping them fed, keeping them healthy. We've done a lot to, to really boost up our productivity and, and animal welfare. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we are constantly challenged by consumers um, and we're challenged by the general public. Um, and so we have to demonstrate a lot of these things that we're already doing. But as I go out into customer uh, operations, what I'm finding is that if if I, if I continue to bring new standards or new tools to help address those animal welfare concerns, I can't get those things implemented if the workforce, those animal caretakers, aren't bought in or understand why we do those things. So we got to work with the people, help remove the barriers that, that prevent them from doing what's expected on their protocols, what's expected of their job responsibilities. And if we keep those things in frame of mind, we're going to meet those animals' needs. But we got to think through the lens of our workers because they're the ones that have that direct impact one-on-one -on -one every single day with the animals. You know, I use the word employee and you've used the word workers and really that's more correct because in a lot of farm operation, those workers are family members, they're not necessarily paid employees, but still as those folks get maybe uh, challenged uh, with bad work conditions, it's harder for them to keep a good attitude and treat the animals as well. Absolutely. And, and, that, and it's not that I'm saying managers need to be accountable for all of the problems on and off the farm that those workers have to tackle. We're all humans. We, we all carry our struggles on and off the farm, right? But it's having the mindset and knowing what those folks are going through, what they're experiencing. Um, I mean, the reality is, is that we have a labor force that is constantly overturning in our industry. Um, and I don't know that technology alone is the solution because animals are too complex. Uh, they require they require uh, specialized care most of the time and robots I don't know can do that just yet you never know right but at the same time you know younger crowds those college students nowadays a lot of them aren't really signing up to work at the farm right and so really what do we have to do um, in order to keep who we have we have a lot of great skilled laborers whether it's family owned operations or not lots of great folks that know exactly what they're doing how to best carry out all of those expectations and and meet those good animal welfare principles 
struggles um, and just really think about it through their lens. Think about it. What is it that they endure with all those weather conditions, with all the increased number per head that people are, are uh, um, expected to, to treat or doctor and whatnot, right? Just thinking about what is it that they go through. Hold that in the, in the back of our minds as we move forward and try to incentivize, recognize, appreciate, empower, or really even for new hires. We get a lot of new hires that have never been on a farm, right? Try, don't just throw them out to shadow someone for two weeks and expect it all to be done and they'd be as productive as anyone else, right? We got to think about it from their individual standpoint and really take that into consideration. And the more that our industry can start using objective metrics to better understand that, that's going to, that's really going to be what helps us move forward. I know a lot of what I'm talking about sounds touchy-feely and that's not very easy for a cattleman or myself as a scientist to swallow and I don't blame them. That's a very complex area. But I think that like animals, we, we know a lot about our animals. We figure it out and the animals can't tell us what's wrong and we already know what's wrong before they start feeling sick, right? Mm -hmm. So we just got to start thinking about taking that and, 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 th and now actually transferring it over to our people. How can we, how can we have better feedback to them? Uh, what about if we ask for feedback? We actually have to do something with it, right? And, and, and demonstrate that we're hearing them out and, and when we invest in our cattle, we invest in our facilities, demonstrate that we're investing in our people, right? And so there's lots of different Different ways that you can definitely achieve a lot of those a lot of those outcomes in terms of lifting up the the workers making them feel empowered having them feel like they're productive members of that operation that they have long-term goals that they can achieve at that operation we're visiting with Michelle Lorenzo she's animal welfare officer for Alanco this is Kyle Bauer reporting from San Antonio thanks Kyle after the break it's this week's Kansas soybean update stay tuned I'm Bob Swartz, and I've devoted the last 43 years to helping Kansans reach their retirement goals and to protect the family farm. At Bob Swartz Financial, we believe everyone should be able to live the retirement they've always dreamed of. Our team of professionals can help you create an efficient strategy using a variety of investment vehicles to help you address your financial needs and your concerns. Bob Swartz Financial values, commitment, and transparency. Okay, looks like it's time for our tour. Welcome to the Fort Wallace Museum. Here at the museum, you're gonna find some really interesting stuff like our replica stagecoach from the Butterfield Overland Dispatch. We've got facades from the fort buildings. We've got an 1870s flag. There's a plesiosaur that was discovered locally. We've got the Ray pump organ collection. We're a little bee place with a great big story and we'd love to have you. This segment brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Joining us now is Mike Steenhook, who's the executive director of the Soy Transportation Coalition. And Mike, you just recently received good news concerning a project that's taken place in the lower portion of the Mississippi River that is going to be good news for many Kansas producers. You know, if I was to be asked what's the number one infrastructure enhancement that would provide the greatest benefit to the widest array of farmers that throughout the United States would be deepening the lower Mississippi River. It's really the launching point for 60% of U.S. soybean exports, 59% of corn exports, by far the number one export region for both commodities. And there's been this long aspiration to deepen that stretch of the river, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, past New Orleans into the Gulf of Mexico from 45 feet to 50 feet. We had good news late last year before Christmas that Congress provided the funding for it. And now on February 10th, the administration gave the green light to move forward with it. So work will commence on it later this year, and we anticipate at least that first critical phase being done by fall of 2021. Farmers have really been actively engaged in this, and one of the things that we really aspire to do is to make it a Kansas thing, a Minnesota thing, a Missouri thing, and we were successful in doing that. So we had this broad coalition that really promoted it. The farmer directors of the United Soybean Board actually committed $2 million to help underwrite the cost of the project, the non-federal component of it. So we're very happy that this is going to move forward. It's going to make us more competitive, and we're going to see the benefits of that extend into the interior parts of the country in the form of more profitability for farmers. 
we'll just use soybeans as an example, they head towards that direction. You don't have to look further than getting a lot of them out to the port of Catoosa. Farmers in Kansas that are willing to drive a considerable distance to access that market because they can get a more favorable price and it offsets the higher cost of delivery to places like the port of Catoosa. And so it's a very appealing marketing opportunity and we want to see that enhanced. And so making that barge to ocean vessel supply chain more economical, deepening the lower Mississippi will help achieve that. We also are excited that when you make barge transportation more economical, what that essentially does is it extends the draw area to our major rivers and it creates greater modal overlap between barge and rail. That puts a downward pressure on rail rates because rail has to fight more to get their customers and barge has to fight more to get their customers. Competition is a good thing for shippers. It's a great thing for farmers. And those were the comments of Mike Steenhook, Executive Director of the Sway Transportation Coalition, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress power to buy Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. After the break, Duane is with Dr. Kelly Sanders, who explains what fetal programming or epigenetics is and how it is used in the beef industry. Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need, and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but yet we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. What if U.S. soybean meal were more than a commodity? If seed companies and the soybean checkoff built a better variety? That future is here. The time is now. To meet end-user demands, the Soybean Checkoff is investing in the compositional quality of soybeans, including meal. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. This segment brought to you by SureCrop, liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Let's go to Dwayne Taves, who is with Kelly Sanders to talk about epigenetics in the beef industry. Dwayne Taves joining you once again here on Ag AM in Kansas and an opportunity to catch up with Dr. Kelly uh, Sanders, Westway Feed Products, talking about uh, something that's a little bit new to the beef industry. Tell us a little about uh, fetal programming or epigenetics and, and what the hope and goal is. Yeah, really our, our main goal, Dwayne, is just to try to get cattle producers to think a little bit about lifetime production of cows, basically. And when is it really important? Well. We would really think cows, the more important time of, of a calf's life is when that calf's born, getting him up and going. And those are really important. Winging's really important. But there's also this time of gestation that we've learned that, you know what, the development of that calf can actually have a lifetime effect on that calf's performance, whether it's a female reproductively or in a feed yard and how it's going to grade at the end of the day. We think about uh, the beef industry for years. We've we've kind of gone through a BRD as an example is one thing that, uh, that we've kind of learned that calves that uh, that have a hard time respiratory wise. Uh, those ranch to rail programs have shown that uh, we have some loss of productivity and carcass quality. But now we're really kind of stepping out here. We're going before they hit the ground. That's got to be a little bit of a test for some people to to buy in. I would expect. Yeah, but uh, if you really go back for about 70 years, this has been something that we've kind of known about. Really, until the 80s did we really know on the human side what was going on. And that's what kind of stimulated some research on the cattle side. And they've really been able to determine, you know what, 
when calves that come out of cows that are stressed nutritionally, especially that last trimester, they may not grade near as good in the feed yard, even though they performed really well. So at the end of the day, there's some dollars we're going to leave them left on the table. I think we uh, certainly a lot of guys, uh, particularly if they've been in the kettle business any number of years, anecdotally probably saw it and didn't realize it because you talk about those hard stresses we've had droughts we've had winter blizzards we've had different environmental effects that have put cows behind the eight ball a bit and, and calving in a lower body condition than we really would have liked them to have and didn't always understand what the effect was yeah it's it's uh, interesting you can ask cattlemen you know across the country do you remember a set of heifers that uh you know that you had you kept and then after two or three years, there just wasn't many of them left in the herd. And usually, that everybody can agree they have they've had that set. What well, usually goes back when they can go back and say, you know what, we went through some really bad heat stress. We went some bad bad winter, and just nutrition was really tough, and we had a hard time on them. And uh, so it's really interesting when you talk about that. People can relate to that because they've they've experienced it. And uh, so it's uh it's it, the question is how do you mitigate that well from an environmental standpoint you really can't mitigate it we can manage through those things we can feed a little harder we can try to have some better you know uh, places for those cows to go maybe and things of that nature to get out of the extreme weather but some of them like hurricanes you just can't affect but the other way of doing it is you know what if we fed those cattle on a say year-round basis a little a little bit differently right is that possible to do it and that's some of the things we're looking at is trying to say how can we feed cattle year-round make that cost of effective and increased performance of the cattle and not have these epigenetic effects. So are the end game uh, obviously raising that plant of nutrition uh, and better matching her particular needs but are there are there specific nutrients or times during that uh, gestation period that we're really trying to zone in on? You know, most of the work's been done probably at the very end, the last trimester, but we do know the first trimester is really, really critical as well, just because that's when all the critical organs are being developed, the heart, the liver, the pancreas, all those different things. A lot of the reproductive organs are being developed during that time frame. So if we alter that development period, then there's particular things that you know calves could have a higher heart rate they could have enlarged aortas and enlarged hearts and things of that nature that might be affect they could have you know energy metabolism could be altered during that time maybe they don't perform as well later on just because metabolism is a little bit different in those cattle but i would tell you that all three stages have important developmental features about them and so we really have to be you know pretty critical on how we manage those cows during gestation in all three stages trimesters. All right, thanks to Dr. Kelly Sanders joining us on Ag AM in Kansas. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Come back after the break for the Kansas Farm Bureau update. Kansas Farm Bureau has served farm families in rural Kansas for more than 100 years. We're pleased to offer new health care coverage choices for Kansans in 2020 through Kansas Farm Bureau Health Plans. No matter what stage of life you're in, we'll have options that fit your lifestyle. Plus, our network of providers is one of the largest available throughout the state of Kansas and beyond. For more information, including the different plans available, or to get a quote, visit kfbhealthplans.com. The Kansas Wheat Innovation Center in Manhattan is rediscovering ways to get improved varieties and new genetics in the hands of farmers faster. Grower-led and checkoff-funded research initiatives are bringing about positive change. This grassroots leadership provides a strong voice in Topeka and Washington, D.C. Now is the time to partner with Kansas Wheat in moving wheat forward. Kansas Wheat Commission and Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, farmers investing in their future and yours. Log on to rediscoverwheat.org. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau update. I'm Britton Rucker and this is Ag AM in Kansas. I'm at the 2020 Young Farmers and Ranchers Conference in Manhattan. And with me now, I have Jacqueline Leffler. And what was your role here? Yeah, so uh, my role has been a lot of different areas uh, at this conference. So I've done anything from judging the collegiate discussion meet to being an attendee and trying to take information back to our own operation. But then also I just got back from Austin uh, doing the final four discussion meet right. um, on the national level. So I've been trying to help some friends out and, and do some of that, you know, just trying to give back just like people gave to me to try to get ready for that. 
What is your background in the ag industry? Yeah, so my background is a uh, fourth generation farmer. Uh, we're in America's Kansas, which is east central Kansas. Uh, we have a row crop operation, so corn, soybeans, and wheat. We're trying to really push uh, some wheat acres and yields and not just make it so that it's just a rotational crop. We're trying to do a little bit more. Right. And then we also have a stocker and feeder operation as well on the cattle side. Um, and then my value added business, Luffler Prime Performance, is where we take mm -hmm. those cattle, turn it into beef, and put it into local freezers direct to consumer. Yeah. So this conference was really diversified in their topics. What was your main takeaway? I think that's that's exactly what it is. It's so diversified. Uh, I think it's trying to figure out you know, where we're going in agriculture and what that's going to look like. And being the next generation that's stepping into our industry, it's so important that we understand right. that we can't stay in our box. Mm -hmm. We can't stay within our own county fence lines. We need to understand the entire state of agriculture mm -hmm. and where we're at and where we can go as a whole together. Right. And you kind of went into that. But really, why should people attend the Young Farmers and Ranchers Conference? And really, what's the benefit to the industry? Yeah, the benefit is networking. We're mm -hmm. in an, an age where if you are not without a network, you're not going to go anywhere. You're right. going to be left behind. And conferences like these, especially the YFNR conference, has given me networks, whether it was you know, somewhere to market my grain differently, or maybe it was getting help to fill out my first FSA loan. Right. You know, I've utilized all these great people that I've used, whether they're my age or staffers, or maybe even a speaker that was mm -hmm. here. Um, I've used all those different avenues to bring back home with me. Mm -hmm. And so it's just all about networking for me at these. Stay with us, we'll be back after the break with Plain Talk. Kansas Corn reminds you that E15 fuel is the right choice for every kind of driver. For the car enthusiast, E15 has higher octane. For the thrifty driver, E15 is priced lower than regular unleaded. For the nature lover, E15 provides cleaner air. For the shopper who buys local, E15 has more ethanol from our Kansas corn farms. Choose E15 for a higher octane, lower price, cleaner American fuel. Message from the Kansas Corn Commission. Learn more at kscorn.com. At Farm Credit, we partner with America's farmers who work hard each and every day to grow the food that we all enjoy. It's not an easy task, but it's an important one. Farm Credit is proud to work with farmers and ranchers, lending support in rural America. This segment brought to you by Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center. Your stem cells, your health, your life. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are talking about today on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk. With the guy who always says there's a very high cost in low living, Dwayne Taves. Well, you know, it all depends on your perspective, but it can be. But it's worth every penny. What do you what? mean by low living? What exactly is low well, living? That'd be like drinking and carousing and... And that's Hanging low out, living? I thought hanging, that was high living. Smoking cigars. I thought that was high living. <laughs> yeah, well, see, it all depends on whether you're whether you're the one enjoying it or not thinking whether there's a high cost to that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Worth every penny. Depends on what brand of cigar and whiskey you're drinking. Well, and as long as I'm not buying it, it's my favorite. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of low living and carousing with pigs, the truffle smelling pig can find those <laughs> tantalizing truffles. Up to three feet underground. Ooh. Fact or fiction? Well, I know. You know, I would love to go watch that sometime. I'm thinking, you've got to get that hog off of that truffle before he eats it. I mean, right. he can find it. The reason he was finding it was because he wanted to eat it. Yeah. And you're wanting to harvest it before he eats it. Some of those are really, really expensive. Yes, exactly right. Wouldn't want um, old... And some of Chester, those, eating, I've, some of those pictures much. I've seen are some pretty good sized hogs. Well, let's face it, full grown hogs only six months old. So, <clears throat> you know, you would have to do some training on him. About the time you got him trained up, he'd get too big to get him off the <laughs> truffles. Oh dear! I actually read somewhere they're doing truffles different than wild now. They actually have them. Cultivated? Cultivated, farmed. Really? And in a controlled environment. What do you, oh, three foot. Three foot down, they can find a truffle. Uh, I'll go with true. That's what it says. Yeah, they like their truffles. Three foot underground. I can't imagine a, a fungal structure growing. Really? You've never dug up a root that was rotting? Well, I guess that would be the same scenario. And it's just, it was just inoculated with a different 
Fungi. Is it yeah. fungi or fungi? Well, it all depends on whether you like him or not. <laughs> I was going to say, I always thought you were the fun guy, and that step between your toes was fun guy. Yeah. You think so? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. I've been to college a lot of years. Uh-huh. Didn't get that many degrees, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> spent a lot of time Took a there. lot of victory laps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's all on your own, you know, yeah. self-worth as to how many years it should have taken. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's fun guy, fun guy. Yeah, well, I've always thought. I think you're everybody a understands what you're talking about. It's well, like yeah, a, absolutely. An onion and an onion. Oh, let's not go into that. Well, let's do go into that. I can't believe after all these years, I actually got you kind of trained over that there is no G in onion. You know how many places that I say it correctly? Only here. Pretty much. Oh, I can live with that. It's when you're around. I, I do it just so I don't annoy you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. Let's work on item number two. Next on the list. <laughs> Next on the Should list. Should have brought things up a little sooner. A little sooner. I'm not sure you're going to live long yeah. enough to get the top ten list cra- cracked off. Um, let's talk about decibels. Measures yes. of sound. Yeah, like okay. in the Chiefs Stadium, for example. Right. They yeah. talk about it being one of the loudest football stadiums. Do you know what the, what the reading is there? I, I remember seeing it. Like 127? Am I making it? Over that 100. I don't remember what exactly what they Well, a car at. horn is 110. Okay. Yeah, I could see that being... Well, it kind of depends on when you're standing next to it or on the block. It depends on how big a car it is. Like, I mean, you know... My wife has a new car, and her horn is embarrassing. It's an e. Oh, it's just you know, pathetic. Seriously. Nobody person, could take it and, and like, seriously. seriously that, no. You want me to do what? Yeah. yeah. And it's... You know, we all should check that horn before we buy a car. And can I mean, you can imagine? One, can like, you imagine? Hey, run like, us through the shop. I want a different horn. Like me stepping out of a car that I've laid on and it's going, ee, ee. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. to the Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center right here in my hometown of Oakley, Kansas. We're the front door of Western Kansas, located on three main highways, I-70, US-83, and US-40. And all those roads lead to history, beautiful scenery, and adventure, no matter which direction you go. We now have an IHOP. That brand that you've trusted up and down the road in all your travels is staffed with local folks, real people, just like you and me, and we're waiting on you to join us. So for fun, adventure, fuel up, fuel your body, and let's have some fun. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply.